Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. We appreciate you taking the time to participate in our webinar, especially at this very busy time of the year. We have two presenters in this session, Dr. Debbie Espinora and Gloria Doherty from George Fox University. We're very excited to have them as our presenters today. Thank you, Debbie and Gloria. Um, today, we also have Anna Thompson and Amy Spielmaker from the board joining me as co-hosts. I just wanted to really quickly mention that Anna is our incoming chair for 2021 and Amy is the chair elect 2022. I will be finishing my term as a chair and I look forward to supporting Anna and Amy in the coming years. The three of us today will help monitor the chat and Q&A areas. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please feel free to send them our way. We don't have closed captioning for the live event, but closed captioning will be added in post-production and all the recordings will be posted on our website. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Debbie and Gloria. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Debbie Espinor. I teach um, in the College of Education and in the College of Business at George Fox. For several years, I was involved with the Digital Fluency Institute at the university, training new faculty in the areas of technology and uh, pedagogy. And I've worked for a long time with Gloria. So I'm gonna let her go ahead and introduce herself. I'm Gloria Doherty and I direct digital learning for the university. Uh, my tenure has been a long career of watching the internet come up and becoming um, a practitioner in designing uh, hybrid and online learning, and now full digital learning across the university. Really glad to be with you today. Yeah, I am going to um, just go back to our proposal a little bit. I think for everybody, when I put my proposal in for this session, it was thinking I would be able to see everybody face to face and have a good conversation back and forth. And as you know, everything has changed. So we are going to be doing some adaptation to our seminar today because of our restrictions and not being able to see your lovely faces this morning. So. Our uh, session objective is really talking about project-based learning and its design and integration into online course design at the university level. And we'll share some of the design elements with you. And it, it, our plan is to give a lot of resources. I have discovered just in my own knowledge of learning how to be a really good online teacher and a on, good Zoom teacher that if I can get little a nugget or two from everything that I learn, I end up adding that into my classroom and it's been really, really helpful. Project-based learning has been really popular in K-12 classrooms for over 30 years, but we have not seen it gain the same kind of traction in higher education that we would like to see. So our webinar objectives today are to, uh, share with you the seven design elements that make up a project-based learning uh, design. And then hopefully you will be able to apply them if you want to put them into your own course design in the future. We'll give you a lot of examples the, of ideas that we have used that have been successful. Um, I crossed out our number four because we are, aren't gonna collaborate in attendance, but we're probably gonna collaborate a bit on chat but we will um, regard the resources and activities or examples of PBL in the courses or programs that we're working with. So Gloria, did you wanna open up the Padlet? I sure will. You'll see that there is a link in the chat I will direct you to. I placed it in a second time. You can click on that Padlet link and it's going to launch in your browser. And there you're going to see two posts uh, we invite you to continue to contribute to those two posts uh, throughout this presentation. Keep checking it to see what all of our participants are sharing. And the two questions we have placed there are, what benefits have you experienced in project-based learning? And what challenges have you handled in project-based learning? You'll be able to simply click to add a comment, type away, and uh, we will all be able to see those comments growing throughout the presentation. Thank you, Gloria. That's you great. That'll give us some, some interaction that we would really love to have. We also are, Gloria and I are very happy to answer questions as we go along. You don't need to 
keep a little note on the side. If you have a question, put it into chat and all of our mon moderators are able to interrupt us really at any time. It's, it's fine with us. Our goal is what's the most effective method of delivering a meaningful education to students? That is becoming more and more and more important as we are developing meaningful, engaging lessons for online students. And so we, we are curious on how can colleges and universities ensure that they're ready for life after graduation um, to tackle new challenges and passions and problems. So research suggests that active learning and higher education, as well as repeated exposure, that's a key, to high impact practices such as project-based learning is the answer. I'm going to click on the link here. One of our mentor agencies is the Worcester Polytech Institute back east. And one of the things that we had planned on doing was attending their um, trainings last June. Obviously that did not happen. But here is a link to give you some thoughts and ideas and resources in higher education. And so all of these links are going to be live here as you get the webinar back in. So I'm not going to click on much more of that, but just to share that there are several universities that have used this and developed programs that are really quite outstanding. And this happens to be one of them. Gloria, do you, any comments on that? I think you've covered it. Okie doke. Um, Gloria and I and an, uh, another colleague went down to PBL World, which is the K-12 version of problem-based learning down in, um, happened to be in Napa, which was quite a lovely spot to have a conference. And we spent four days with over a thousand K-12 teachers uh, being trained in pro project-based learning in the elementary and high school ages. It, I think we were probably one of eight or nine university participants. And the, the idea was that we were going to find some thoughts and ideas to bring back to our university. Um, and the plan was chugging along nicely until of course COVID hit and everything went sideways. But here is another resource that we really have appreciated and that is the PB, PBL Works. Their projects for the K-12 system are quite outstanding and even if they don't necessarily transfer directly to higher education, there are certain things that do, like the teaching rubric that we use, the elements design checklist that we use in higher education and the project planner I've used in my classes. So although it is geared toward K-12, there quite a few of their tools have been easily adapted to what we're using in our classes here at George Fox. So as we move ahead, um, it's really a shift in thinking. And I think we, we call shift in thinking now, we call pivoting. Um, I love all of the new terminology that's happening as a result of our lovely COVID, but when we're thinking about something new, we're really wanting to think about how we integrate it into the culture of faculty development and the digital work at George Fox. So our leading question to our university is how do students engage in real world solutions within the university curriculum? At George Fox, a lot of what we do is a groundswell. It starts in one area and it moves up. It's rarely something that is top down um, within our university. And so Gloria and I have been working with different departments and different faculty members to bring this thought and idea into their own classrooms. Gloria, you wanna talk a little bit about the benefits? Yes, this is uh, some of the talking points that have helped us to gain traction where we can see uh, why we would all upend ourselves, create a lot more work for all of ourselves in order to produce some results. So what we like to point out is that this effort in being able to look at a very broad-based view 
of project-based learning reflects the thriving work environments that we want our students to experience when they move into their careers. That they can develop skills in communication, project management, to be able to work in effective teams. If we can equip them by having experience in the safety of the learning uh, environment, when they move out into their careers, they will be able to take bigger steps, take incremental risk, and be more successful in guiding their teams. So uh, the assessments are going to turn from summative quizzes and exams to formative feedback on organizational and competency-based skills. And you can hear on that, that's a pretty heavy lift. And what we hope is that they will expand their knowledge measurement to skill development and to be able to uh, uh, make application in the real world. The second set of benefits that we like to emphasize is that it develops the soft skills for our learners. And uh, talking about the buzzwords, yes, we've all pivoted to soft skills. And we are finding the statistics are saying that uh, prospective employers place high value on the soft skills. So critical thinking and being prepared to think creatively and take those measured risks. And then most of all, to learn how to authentically collaborate. This is when assessments move beyond academic standing uh, to engage creatively in meaningful projects that rely on peer collaboration in that team and faculty mentoring. I noticed that one of the challenges that was placed on our Padlet is that students do need more direction. Project-based learning doesn't mean that all of us disappear as faculty, but it means that we work even harder to create the frameworks so that our students can organize and be effective in their projects. And then we produce real world results in a culture of continuous improvement. Agile design and design thinking really start to get traction when we start to move in this direction. Uh, finally, in benefits, we like to um, identify that it produces robust outcomes for academic learning and greater success in those career goals. We want to expand our learners' outcomes and the representation of those outcomes through a retooling of the transcript. This could move toward extended transcripts and portfolios of the referenced work. And it gives those prospective employers a real view of the learner's growth and their mastery. Also, this empowers learners. Learners are given agency to engage confidently, eliminate those unintended barriers that we have not recognized, uh, or create resistance for some of our learners, and empower teams to capitalize on their corporate strengths. It also positions the learners to discover how to mine the gaps in their team. Those are real world challenges. And how to expand their success in creativity and collaboration. Imagine these skill sets moving into the workplace and influencing our cultural perspectives for the good of all. And that's that last uh, point in the, in the previous slide if we could just roll back just a moment, promotes equity for today's learners and tomorrow's society. This is not just a buzzword for this moment. What we're saying is that our goal can be to learn how to model healthy, equitable work environments through project-based learning. Now for some of those considerations. And we'll, yep, that's right. We'll look at a few of those challenges. Instructional and institutional culture. In order to be transformative and thrive, it requires full administrative and academic investment. Uh, it harkens back to the online learning progression. If you don't have the support administratively, it could flounder for a long time. Another is the adoption into the faculty workload and to evaluate um, uh, project-based learning. 
It means a redesigning of curricula and courses and to implement continuous assessment of the instructional methods and outcomes. That is a heavy lift. And then finally, uh, the availability, the, the engagement in instructional practices that are deep enough to be responsive and specific opportunities and challenges that they deliver. And then the availability of instructional materials and systems that are relevant so that we budget ourselves to be able to provide the tools that that learner will actually be using in the workplace. And we all know how there have been limitations in that area. I'm, I'm just gonna jump in here, Gloria, and talk a little bit about, um, from a faculty perspective, of the resource of time. Uh, this fall, I think I have worked as hard or harder than I ever have in my career to make a learner engaged classroom, um, especially uh, I'm, I'm doing some face to face, some totally online and some that I have students that are face to face and zooming in at the same time. All three of those pose challenges that are unique to, to that specific design. And um, I don't know if, if the rest of faculty around the world are feeling the same structures, but I've taught for a long time. And to make this engaging for students and worth their tuition dollars, I, I know I have invested a lot more time. Now, Gloria, you work with faculty. What are you seeing? I, I'm seeing a lot of adoption within courses because we have a lot of agency there and then in turn can design a lot of agency for the learners. So it's very um, uh, easily implemented within a course, but it's also very limited because you can't get a really big project going unless you develop it across a program. Okay, so, so really when we're talking about project-based learning, we're also talking about across a curriculum, across a department, um, not just in a specific class. Right, and I think our STEM programs are, have been leaders in that. Okay, well, as we move into some of the actual details of project-based learning, I, I wanted to remind us that Albert Einstein, bless his heart, said is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. And I think um, at least my experience with students this fall is they're having a hard time finding the joy in education. And so as a teacher, I am trying always to put things back in that give them the opportunity to remember how much fun learning can be. And um, so that is my challenge. That's my challenge to myself. So one of the, we're gonna start here with just a, a few infographics that we work really well for us. And I'm going to pull this one up in a different manner from the PBL Works website. This actual infographic has probably been the most valuable in our trainings of explaining the difference between doing a project and project-based learning. We have, when we've trained faculty, said, gosh, I have a project in every single course. Um, I don't understand how this is different than what we're doing right now. And so when we look at the dessert part of our projects, it's more of an add-on. It's like, oh, we need to get students engaged. Let's, let's put a project in. And I'm going to develop that project and make it really interesting for the student. And that product that they're all going to be doing, they're going to really work with that. If we aren't thinking, we don't relate it to the standards and skills that are actually built into the course. And a lot of our students can complete it by themselves or at home with online learning. It stays within the course. So once our courses go offline or we start a new semester, that project is done. And then the end result is displayed in the classroom. And so we have a presentation or we have a podcast or we have an infographic or any of the, the creative things that we do to get students engaged. But 
it still is um, nestled within the classroom setting. So PBL Works talks about project-based learning as being the meaty main course or vegetarian main course, however you lean that way. But the instruction is actually integrated into the unit. So it really falls along the whole part of the course. Students have a lot of choice in this. We're gonna talk about all of these different areas as we move forward. It's focused on the product and the process of getting there. It's aligned to academic standards. All of our courses should be or are aligned to standards that are outside our specific course. They're either with a professional program or the university standards. It involves collaboration with the students. And then the teacher is, is alongside that, but is not driving the project. It has a real world application that goes along with it. And then the results are shared beyond the classroom with a public audience. And we have a couple examples of areas that that has happened just within our university. And there's tons of examples within the PBL area. This is also, um, we've handed this out. You would have gotten a handout if you had been with us live. It shares, it, it's basically the gold standard PBL just in a nutshell, talking about all of the different sections of that goes into making a project and then the identifies those along the way. There is a link for that and you can look at it. I'm not gonna spend my time looking at it right this moment here, but it does give us information on just how to quickly move in. I actually have this hanging in my office to remind myself that of when I'm thinking about classes before they even start, what are areas that I can build up student engagement? And then the third one and last one of our infographics, I am going to bring this one up so that we can see is as 10 best practices for project-based learning for specifically for online courses. And when we look at that, we know that when we teach in different formats, there is a different set of planning and there's a different set of thinking that goes into all of those. And so when we're working with Zoom breakout rooms, or we're actually forming teams for students. We have some of our classes where the students are literally all over the world. So if you're going to be forming teams, you're going to want to think about things like time zones. And if students are going to be working outside of class, making it easier for them. Um, we can take surveys to find out the strengths of our students and align them in their teams. And so there can be different, I love the idea of auditioning for teams as part of a introduction. We can share different communication channels, not necessarily all of the ones that we have, but I, I do know my doctoral students use Slack a lot to communicate. And so we, uh, we can open up thoughts and ideas. We can provide virtual space and team collaboration on a Saturday class that's supposed to go for eight hours. A lot of our professors get high Zoom fatigue and so do our students. And so there may be opportunities to move outside of our Zoom classroom and have them work in virtual space. We can provide a task list with due dates to kind of guide them along the way, especially if a project is going to go over several weeks or even the whole course. And then make sure that we're checking in and we're giving feedback to each team as they're moving forward. I love, uh, robust is a great word. It, it reminds me of a great meal where you're sitting down and all of the flavors blend together and all of the experience of being together and eating together provide an experience that is bigger than the actual project. And so we want our students to experience that when they come away saying, gosh, that was a, an amazing experience. And then the peer review. Uh, a lot of students, especially my experience right now, is they're asking for a lot of feedback. They're tentative. They're, they're not sure if they're doing it right. If you could see me, you would see my hand quotes on that. 
but there is, they need to um, get evaluation on a steady basis. And that is just the snacking along the way here using our analogy of food for me. So those are some of the introductory forms on this. Gloria, do you have anything to add on that before I move on? Um, I just want to say that as we look through that list, we start to see how that is reflecting the kind of workplace, the real world place that we would want them to be equipped for. Um, it all moves right into um, continuous improvement and engaging uh, to be able to succeed in throughout the careers. Okay, great, thanks. That was a good addition there. Um, we're going to talk about the design elements that do make up a project. We're going to look a little deeper on that. The first one is um, a challenging problem or question, and that is that knowledge is perceived as meaningful and purposeful. And if it is perceived this way, it will be more easily recalled. It needs to have a real world action. On this slide that you will have, we have a resource for driving questions. I'm not gonna to move to it because you can look at it and link to it of, of how do we really get a real world problem. Our, I've, I've found our students care deeply about the environment. They care deeply about equity. They care deeply about things that are happening in the world. And so if their driving question or their challenging problem is something that they can get behind, their product will be greater than the sum of the parts. The sustained inquiry for students um, is how do you get students to stay focused in class? Um, we talk a bit about Zoom fatigue, but it's also about how they can be engaged for an extended period of time by asking questions. They're the ones that are choosing. They're the ones that are doing the research. They're the ones that are applying the information. That goes in opposite oftentimes of how we develop our courses because we, we spoon feed them. We give them all of the resources. We tell them this is the most important thing. We tell them these are the most important resources to look. But what would happen if we flipped that and the students were responsible for finding the most important thing? the most important resources and applying that information for their classroom peers. Authenticity, it's real world. We keep coming back to that because it needs to be something where students are, that, that they will find an achievement in. Basically, it's making the experience real. It needs to be age appropriate and of course that that depends on whether you're teaching first year freshmen or uh, doctoral students. The tools that they use have to be arranged um, and they can be doing all sorts of different things that don't cost money like letters to the editor or arranging ex exhibitions or doing their own podcasts. The impact, the presentations and the things that they're doing need to be beyond their, their classmates, um, even outside, bringing outside viewers into our Zoom presentations would be a good example of being able to get students just to elevate that up one notch if you get two or three other faculty or uh, professors that come in and are able to observe. And then it, it needs to be personal. Students need to, under, they need to be able to look at their own personal concerns and their own interests and their own issues as it ties into the courses that you are teaching for them. We talk a lot about student voice and student choice. Um, projects expect more of our students. They are the ones that decide. They are the researchers. They are the activists. The teacher walks alongside and helps them in the idea of creation and co-researching, but really we are trying to make citizens out of people that will come into the workforce and be able to immediately use their skills and talents to work directly in the workforce. That is what our um, 
market is showing that all of this knowledge is great and grand, but if they can't apply it into the work into the workplace, then that, that it becomes a bit of a problem. Then there becomes the time where you step back. Students and professors, the reflect on the inquiry and the activities and the quality and the obstacles. And so instead of just moving forward from step to step to step, this is the time where we step back and take a look at all of the other steps. John Dewey says we don't learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on our experiences. And that is what's making so many of us think about our courses differently. And for those of you that are joining us today, I would imagine that you are interested in making your courses um, design a little bit different than what they might have been in the past. When we're done reflecting, we can give and receive and use feedback. So we, this is a cycle. So once you've stepped back, everybody's reflected, then we're looking at using feedback to improve the processes and products that people are working at. This is very much a draft format and it's very much something that happens often in the workplace, whether in teams or individually or on Google Docs, everybody has a voice in this. And where we're building in checkpoints where students receive feedback from all of us. And it, that could even be from other faculty or other students. This has to be taught. Critique has to be taught and modeled. And that's where our faculty have a, a strong influence in that. So here's an example of a project, a public product that was happened at George Fox. Um, the project, we are asking students to create a product. And one of our students created a Lego ideas that is, it's called the brick. And I don't have the um, link to this, but this is, this Lego opens up and it, it goes between two fairy tales. So it's a book and the book opens and the book shows two different fairy tales. Now, I bought this book for my eight-year-old grandson and it is one of his favorite things to, to look at, but the design came from one of our undergraduate students who obviously now has sold it to Lego and is working on it um, on probably something else that I'm excited to see. Uh, Gloria, do you wanna talk about this other pro public product that we have? Yes, this is another example, and this has happened a couple of times for us. The first piece of this is that uh, faculty acted as an editor and gave a group of students uh, who had been uh, completing, uh, close to completion of a program to be able to apply their learning by writing chapters. So they were involved in scholarly publication with a faculty editor. Once that book was established, we then turned and we were able to join in a group uh, of students in design. They have created a process that culminates in design studio, which then is delivered over a semester. Students will meet with clients. And so the faculty editor and I met with that group of students. They interviewed the uh, editor to get a sense of the project. And then they established a team. So they bring in clients, interview the clients, and then they organize into teams based on their agency and moving toward projects that they want to work on. So in this case, a team of those uh, soon to graduate students designed the book cover professionally and delivered it for this monograph that is now uh, publicly available. Cool, that kind of just lets us jump right into the idea of portfolios as a project-based learning project. Do you wanna start with that, Gloria? Yep, that sounds good. Uh, let's scroll to that next slide. Okay. And here's what we want to say. Uh, there are two major things that the portfolio will do for us as learners, and that is it will demonstrate learning progress and then culminate in academic achievement. 
And what I want to say is step number one is actually reflection. When the student is able to reflect on how they will build their portfolio and determine what has value to them. So they are able to um, organize their learning and recognize their progress as they do that. And then it gives them agency in representing the value they find in all those achievements. This portfolio idea also helps the faculty and advisors to determine how a learner could be successful in applying their learning in creative and integrative ways. So that portfolio serves throughout the program to be able to help the learner see, but also advisors see how they could capitalize on their strengths. And then it invites the world to see the story. So now the student as a graduate is able to demonstrate to uh, future employers the kinds of gifts they have, the progress that they make, and how they can deliver in the real world. That's awesome. I'm going to share with you um, one of the things that I use, and I'm going to navigate over to it. It is the portfolio um, for my doctoral students. They have a teaching practicum or a consulting practicum. And as it loads up here, this is a semester long course that they have. I have gotten permission from my student here that I'm going to be sharing this um, with you guys today. But my students have a product that ends up being something that they are really proud of and working on. Now I'm looking for Eva. And I just had Eva up earlier and she moved. Where did she go? <laughs> I had her. I, I wonder if it's just over just a little bit farther here. Huh. Eva Fast just disappeared. So I, I've talked to other ones of my students and so I'm going to show you one of Sarah's. Sarah Cooley, she did, um, she's in business marketing and she did her portfolio. She was, um, <laughs> what's going on with my connections here? All right, I'm gonna try something else. When in doubt, go back to what I have and there is Eva. So for whatever reason, Eva, disappeared on that link, but she's here on this one. And her portfolio, this, this portfolio is a place where everybody can put in their information. So this is her teaching portfolio that she used when she did her marketing course. She was able to put all of her information and all of her assessments into one spot. And she did a journal, she had her lesson plans, and she had her personal growth plan. When she did that, then she was able to use this in the real world to actually get a job as an academic herself. Because I know when I was looking um, when I chaired a department and was looking for new faculty, the opportunity to see someone actually do a lesson plan or do teaching. Some of my students will also record video themselves of them teaching that all comes up and it works really well. So this is a gathering place as opposed to our LMS where it be, it's static. This still, she can still add things and still use the portfolio link for use as she moves forward. Um, Gloria, do, do you have any other people that are using portfolio in the university? Um, engineering. Okay. Uses it. Yes. And, and the, for the very same reason. That's right. Okay. Awesome. You want to talk about Google Sites? Yes, uh, so a lot of our faculty also use Google Sites um, where they find that it has the kinds of flexibility that they want 
um, compared to portfolio. And what you're seeing here is simply a, a link to some tutorials and one example that's publicly available where you're able to build a blog-like portfolio to build out um, as a student uh, progressively through your program. And you've got some links I see here. Yep, so um, when they go to the PDF, they should be able to click on that image to go into that particular publicly available example. And then down in the lower right corner, you can click to the tutorials on how to set up so when you go into the new Google Sites uh, that is more blog-like in its layout, more um, stylized, there is a portfolio template. Okay, yeah. that, that's good. Now we've given a lot of resources. One of the ones that I wanted to show, I'm gonna see if this is gonna pop up the right way for me. Um, not everybody is on Facebook and not everything in Facebook is of value, but I have found this to be highly valuable, the Higher Ed Learning Collective. And it is really specific to um, how to make your online courses really pop. And so I'm just gonna scroll down just a little bit here because everybody's putting on different comments about Zoom and what things have worked and what things haven't. And so for those of you that are Facebookers, this might be uh, something that is interesting. There's also a YouTube channel that goes along with it. And then the Online Learning Collective has been helpful. We've looked at the PBL Works and we've looked at Worcester as well. Uh, Gloria has put a few more resources. Do you want to talk about some of these? Some of these are uh, links that are also embedded. Uh, you will see that um, the seven essential project design, that circular design that was in the infographic and uh, more detail in a white paper on it. Okay. And then the design rubric, and I think you pointed those things out and the planner uh, that have been very helpful to organize a project. What about understanding by design? Yeah, so this is that idea of looking at things from the programmatic uh, view on down into courses, backward design, so that you're able to see those essential questions, be able to see the student learning outcomes, and then design projects that will be meaningful for the student, but also academically help them achieve. Okay, great. Well, yeah. there's quite a few of those. So Weiwei and team, is, is did anybody interested in chatting a bit about these or in the comments about PBL or experiences that other people have had? We, we had a very interesting question uh, back when you were uh, showing us doing the project mm -hmm. versus, and here is the question, are there ways that doing a project approach can be a gateway into PBL? Um, anything that is a gateway into PBL it is very valuable. And I think having our, um, it's, it's the way we think about a project in a classroom. And usually when I think about a project in the classroom, it is not static. It moves throughout a whole semester, whether that be the, a quarter of 10 weeks or a semester of 15 weeks. It, and then the product at the end is more public. Gloria, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's right. I think um, it, it is good to take steps toward and uh, be able to reflect and, and build. Uh, and then there can be that threshold when we start to see that projects can grow in scope. So the answer is yes, that's a good starting point. Yeah. Especially if you have not done a lot of it before in your classes. And of course it depends on the subject and the age level of the student and all of those other considerations that we have. Thank you, Gloria and Debbie. Um, I am just wondering if you would mind taking a look at the Padlet and yeah. the comments. Um, what caught my eye were there were some challenges addressed by our attendees. I'm just wondering if you could um, address some of the challenges that they pointed out. 
Yeah, so one of the first things that was listed is some students want more direction under the challenges. Some mm -hmm. students want more direction. Yes, and we are discovering, at least I am discovering, that our students are anxious this year. And so they are wanting more from me as a professor to, to do what I want. It is a challenge for us to help change their confidence levels. And so a project that is designed for them to choose is harder than for, for us to choose for them. And so we have to nicely keep handing it back. It's the, you know, I don't know why I'm into food analogies today, but it, I have um, food on my plate and I am going to feed you as opposed to you have food on your plate and it may be different than the food on my plate and you are going to be consuming it. And so helping our students move into um, the idea of finding something that really engages them. And sometimes you have to build a team around different subjects. For instance, you might have a Google survey that asks students in an environmental science class, what are the three biggest issues that you see in our world today? And then you put people into teams. That is faculty direction, but where they go from that is team direction. Gloria? Yep, that's, uh, that's great. I, I'm going to read another one that kind of uh, relates a bit to, to that, and that is the observation that the first go around can really flop. Students don't like to be guinea pigs. And that's true, and neither do adults. None of us <laughs> like guinea pigs. <laughs> but yeah. I think that we know our students well, and as we know our students, we work really hard to, um, to engage with them and tell them what we're doing along the way. We could even be totally transparent and share the whole project base idea with them before we engage them in a project so that they know exactly where we're going, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it may be that our first group gets a lot more direction than groups that move on from there because we've, we are learning along with them. And um, so that's, that's what I've discovered is that the more transparent I am with why I'm doing what I'm doing and giving them the big picture before we even start, that's helpful for me. Gloria, what have you yeah. found? Um, I've also found that uh, if you can demonstrate to the students that there is a framework, you know, so that project management piece, if they can discern the framework, they feel the support. Another aspect to this is in coaching students to engage in their own agency and motivate themselves. So it can be as simple as creating a group contract. Uh, where you might, again, provide a framework, but then they work out the details of how their team will operate and the commitments that they will make to each other. So those are just some of the things that can help engage them and help them see the structure that supports them. Yeah, though that's a great idea. I, I like the idea of a contract. Are there some other challenges that were out there since I can't see our Padlet? Yeah, let me, let me read another one. Uh, there, there are two more, so here's one. Uh, it can create equity problems if the project requires transportation or scheduling outside of class. Yes, and that is true. Um, we're trying to just work within our online area for this purpose, but I do think that there are ways of being able to modify things so that it can be in class or, um, you know, using some of our own class time for project work. I, I hadn't really thought about that in terms of the equity, but it certainly is something that we would need to think a little bit more deeply. With the online work, That my equity thoughts are more about um, time zones 
and working with students. I have a student now in one of my classes that's zooming in and and she's living in Hong Kong. And so um, she gets up at 3.30 in the morning for my class. And there, there just isn't a lot I can do to make changes in that. Yeah, and, th and then also things like um, when you have distributed teams, uh, what kinds of uh, digital support they, they're going to have access to, connectivity issues, Mm -hmm. um, or being able to layer things so that they don't have to have um, high connectivity all the time. Uh, those, those are all considerations. Yeah, I, I like that last one is to make sure that, it, that all their work doesn't always have to be together. Right, yeah, and, and not demanding of um, high connectivity uh, digitally. So, yeah. And the last okay. one. Yeah, the last one is, Time is time, PBL is time consuming for both faculty and students. It is, and, and that's a statement. It's really not a question. <laughs> <laughs> it is time consuming. It is, um, it's not something, when we work with our faculty at George Fox, it is not something that we, a week before a, a course, decide to put in. It is, it is, for me, I, I work with faculty thinking about what course would be the best course for a project-based learning experience. Or do you teach two courses back to back where you have the same students? And then what design would work best? It could take up to two or three semesters to really build a strong project within a program. Uh, one of the things that the doctor of business is looking at is using a project-based model um, as students work toward their dissertation. And so a lot of that would be having buy-in from the faculty to have components of a project along the way. This works really well if you, if you have co cohort-based learning and the students are moving along the way, but it, then it takes buy-in from faculty as well. And it is time consuming, but it also on the flip side, really works with the student's ability to jump into the real world and use the model as they move outside. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd emphasize uh, what you were describing there is that ability to do um, something that avails us to a stronger program assessment. Mm -hmm. Is the program delivering what we expected it to deliver? How, how well are the students succeeding along the way? So when we have that buy-in throughout the program, it gives us those indicators uh, and really helps with, with that assessment. Yeah, it does. Were yeah, there so there any in there, in there that um, we, we don't want to bring out? Say that again? There any other comments or, or thoughts within the well, panel? I, I will hop over to the benefits side and, and, and maybe we can finish with that. So uh, one of the comments on the benefits of, ex of experiencing is that students are able to create things they'll actually use in their work or their future work. Yep, um, that is definitely true. And students tend to be more motivated as they have the freedom to choose projects that they're interested in. I have found that to be the case in my own courses. And it is about me learning to give up all of the control in a class. It, it, it forces one to trust students with their own learning. Yeah. yeah. Um, and here's kind of a perfunctory one. There's no way to cheat. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah. I like that too. I like, of course, we, we here at George Fox would hope that none of our students would ever, <laughs> but we know that that is unrealistic. But there's a, it's, I like that benefit. Um, it works for students at all levels, the bachelor's, graduate, and degree completion. It does. And, and I've taught at all levels and I've used projects at all levels and have found it to be successful after the first few road bumps. Yeah. And the last one here, which I think sums it up, is that it is 
very engaging and meaningful learning. That is our hope and especially ways to bring it into our online world that we're living in now. So Weiwei, I think that we've kind of concluded here. Is there any other things that we need to talk about? Um, we actually do have a couple more questions for you, but I don't know if we have time for both of them. So um, Amy, would you like to uh, get one question first and see how we're doing in time? Yeah, um, so I was curious. Um, Project-based learning and problem-based learning, you hear those two terms a lot. How mm -hmm. are they different? That's a great question. Um, the problem-based is, is more about the, the challenging question, and the project-based is more about the, the inquiry. On, for instance, um, you would take a question and run it down into a final uh, into a final result like the book. So the book would be more along, you know, working with a faculty member. The project would be more along the Lego idea where there's actually something that is tangible that comes out from it. Gotcha. Uh, Gloria? Yeah, I, I think that's the distinctive is um, it delivers a real world product. Yeah. Most, most often, yeah. And it's used interchangeably, and, and mm -hmm. I even use it interchangeably when I forget. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's see, 56, yep, okay. So you mentioned soft skills. Um, how do you recommend kind of it's assessing those things? You know, along with the finished project at the end, how do you assess the soft skills that they've gained? Sorry, I'll let you go on that one. Yeah, so there, um, and it's escaping me, we all know the group, at, uh, the, the 21st century uh, skills and the rubrics that they have are outstanding and covers everything from society down through to communication. So we highly recommend those rubrics as a starting point and then uh, being able to work with students to help them determine the values uh, that they think are, they're going to need uh, in terms of soft skills. And, and then prospective employers. They're very willing to share. Okay, great, thank you. Debbie, would you like to contribute as well? Or? Oh, Gloria nailed that one. <laughs> <laughs> She's got that one. So uh, I think we're getting close to being done. Yeah, well, thank you so very much, Gloria and Debbie, um, for sharing your insights and expertise and some of your students' work. It's all very inspiring. And thanks, everyone, for attending the session. We're going to close the webinar for now. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, to Debbie, Gloria, me, Amy, Anna. Um, you know how to contact us. Um, we have four more sessions this year, so we look forward to seeing you in our future sessions. Thanks very much. Bye Thank for you. now.